Welcome. I am William Calvin. Starting with Harvard Medical School in 1962, I've been hanging around med schools for 60 years, and am now a professor emeritus at the University of Washington's Medical School in Seattle. I've also been hanging around climate science since 1982, asking questions at their departmental seminars for almost 40 years. And, since I retired in 2004, I have been devoting most of my time to the climate crisis. A few of my 17 books, see WilliamCalvin.org, are about climate, most involve other complex dynamical systems such as brain function and human evolutionary pathways. Climate dynamics is not the only complex nonlinear system that I have analyzed. Hello. Settle in for another uncomfortable ride. Though it does get hopeful toward the end. This is the final talk in a series of four on extreme weather has created a climate emergency. Kickstarting Climate's Manhattan Project. Cleaning up the excess CO2 will cool us off and reduce the extreme weather that threatens the global economy and climate repair projects. The CO2 cleanup will also fix the surface ocean acidification. Part 1 introduced us to the surges in extreme weather between 2002 and 2010, and the jet stream's role in promoting them. Part 2 introduced us to the mindset problems in responding to the climate emergency and compared them to the physician's mindset, which we teach in medical school. Part 3 showed us that most climate solutions are pretty wimpy, that we will have to invent our way out of this crisis in order to remove the excess CO2 before the year 2040. Part 4. While sea level rise is baked in, a climate cooling is still possible by 2040 that ought to reduce extreme weather. I sketch out a Manhattan Project 2.0 for climate action. I suggest a tech billionaire funded governor's design initiative to get the pre deployment phases up and running. The climate crisis is a lot to wrap our hearts, heads, and strategic policy around. It is a complex jigsaw puzzle, each piece of which is a downer. That makes it a lot like war, where everyone pitches in, doing something for the common good. Note that our ancestors survived many catastrophes and that, as a species, our situation is hardly hopeless. The more relevant danger is that our civilization will collapse, and with it, the ability to feed 7.9 billion people. Result? Famine, pandemics, wars, genocides. Climate action is a major challenge, like fighting a great war, another do it or else that demands our best thinking and collaborative action. Are we doing that? Not yet. At the high end, its potential impact ranks somewhere between repeated global economic collapses and a 90% human population crash. To call it a human extinction threat might be overclaiming, but the chain reaction, from extreme weather hits to agriculture, to the economy, and to security, does indeed qualify as a looming threat of a population crash that would lose civilization. We need to focus on getting through the next 20 years in a way that avoids the slippery slope that collapsed several dozen societies in the past, such as Jared Diamond described in his 2003 book, Collapse. Global effort on the climate problem, from community organizations to the highest UN levels, has focused for a half century on reducing emissions from burning fossil fuels. And not much else. But things have changed, because of extreme weather and the 50 years of additional CO2 accumulation. As logical as it sounds, emissions reduction will not work in time to prevent a major human population crash. It's too little, too late. It's the extremes, not the averages that cause the most damage to society and to many ecosystems. Climate scientist Claudia Tabaldi Beware of averaging, 
as it gives the impression of a smoother ride than will likely occur. Between 2002 and 2010, five types of extreme weather surged. We are no longer dealing with a gradual approach to disaster. About 15 years ago, five types of extreme weather leapt on stage, as if a threshold had been crossed. They arrived with no warning and show no signs of going away. Given the possibility of additional sustained surges, an effective climate intervention must now be quick, very quick, such as a major carbon dioxide, CO2, clean up over the next 20 years. Will they control climate change by 2050? Not a chance. All worthwhile things to do for other reasons, but the amount of climate change they will affect, let alone control, is now insignificant. And control misleads people, suggesting that we are doing something effective. That slows down arriving at something which will actually work. The current mindsets, even for our leaders, Outright climate denial, one-third of the U.S. population. Current emissions are the problem. Not passing 2 degrees Celsius is our problem. Instead, tri-extreme weather is the most immediate threat to civilization, with a brief window of opportunity for fixing it. Focus. This prompts us to rethink our assumptions about climate change and our future, Additional strategies are now needed. Key features of the climate problem. Economic threat from extreme weather. Heat wave threat. Destruction from wind, flood, fire weather, stalled hurricanes. Knock on resource wars, genocides, pandemics, famine. Sea level rise, expansion of the tropics pushing deserts away from tropics. That's somewhat slower, as is. Ocean acidification threatening the food chain. Let us come back and expand on the economic threat. Food stolen on the trip from farm to plate. What if there are no more loans for seeds? Synchronous droughts around the world, and our current just-in-time practices to minimize stockpiles. Imagine growing seasons becoming so unpredictable that a second crop rarely succeeds. Extremes create their own problems, even when the averages stand still. Expanding on the heat wave threat, note that sweating stops working in high humidity, so there will be many heat stroke deaths in places along the Gulf of Mexico coast, the Nile Delta, around the Arabian Gulf, in South Asia, and soonest of all, the Mekong Delta. Climate refugees usually cannot support themselves, becoming a burden. Backing out of the epidemic of extreme weather onset during 10-year temperature rise hiatus, rather ruins our notion of trouble arriving gradually with temperature. Slowing the overheating, our current goal, will not address extreme weather surges. The new goal must be cool off. Quickly. That needs lots of new photosynthesis, with sequestering of its organic carbon to remove potential CO2 from circulation for a thousand years. Reforestation fails on this new short time scale. It provides too small an effect, relative to need. We would need to protect the new trees from arson, lightning, drought, and illegal harvesting. Even if we succeed, after 30 to 50 years, a forest is no longer a net sink for CO2 because rotting balances new growth. The forest becomes a liability, what with continuing need for water, fire protection, ocean-based CO2 removal. The only big underutilized surface area is oceans 70%. But simply fertilizing to sink more than the usual 20% via the biological pump would now need five-fold increased primary production, worldwide. This would wreck ocean systems. Clearly, we need to speed up the sinking of organic carbon cell debris into the depths, its usual destination, before it can oxidize to CO2 via bacterial respiration. Thus, the initial 2040 drawdown needs to focus on the ocean's carbon cycle. We might also need solar radiation management, more low clouds, high haze, or a maneuverable sunshade in space, to protect us during deployment. An arctic halo would be a good place to start, 
to keep enough floating ice throughout the summer so that enough sunlight is deflected. But we do not have to choose the method now. What the Kickstart needs now is a design consortium of assorted experts to design something 10 to 100 times better than the existing proposals for removing excess CO2 and cooling us off. I will give a simplified teaching example of a scrubbing process that fits most of the design criteria, just to give an idea of what we have to work with. It won't satisfy the experts. It is simplified. I stress the fastest timeline for doing the restoration, however it is done. What we need this year is a kickstart that does the design and prototyping while educating governments about the need for taking over the nonprofit project a few years later. I will explain the diagram in a minute. The focus of all our climate efforts is now use less, aka emissions reduction. However logical, it isn't working. Even if it were, it isn't big enough to meet the current need, let alone the future need. And the prospects are not good because of heat waves, many countries will be forced to extract more of their fossil fuels in order to power more air conditioning. There is now a new time scale for saving civilization from collapse. Economic collapse. Wars. Genocides. Pandemics. These spell population crash. Forget end of century climate goals. Think 2040. Extreme weather surges have created a climate emergency, where a climate fix within several decades is now urgent. A carbon dioxide cleanup is the only action that will actually cool, reduce extreme weather, and counter ocean acidification. However, sea level rise will continue for many centuries. Cooling will not repair the rotten ice that develops at the bottom of ice sheets, once meltwater thaws the attachment to rocks. And so the ice slides downhill to raise sea level. The Future Without Climate's Manhattan Project Here is a plausible chain of events as extreme weather worsens over the next 20 years. The climate impacts are unspecified, but they surely include fatalities, repair costs, the number of new climate refugees, etc. Events of the recent past include climate instability developed between 2002 to 2010 and has not retreated. Whatever climate actions we undertake, extreme weather will hinder our efforts. In some year, extreme weather kills the global economy. The resulting chaos kills any big project. In one region after another, a billion people may be lost in the familiar manner, war, famine, pandemics, and genocide. Such is the slippery slope that we must avoid. The five surges in extreme weather between 2002 and 2010 say that we may have little time. Goals such as avoiding 0.5 degrees Celsius are obsolete. The Future with a Climate Manhattan Project once the yearly CO2 removal exceeds the continuing emissions, in CO2 equivalents, cooling can begin during the second year of the ramp-up in scrubbing capacity. One assumes that the extreme weather will moderate, but complex dynamical systems often have some hysteresis, so that the path back is different from the path up. That's something where the design team, early on, will want to commission some modeling studies. Infectious diseases like malaria have a long chain of transmission, affording many places at which to block spread. One need not attack the root cause to be effective. Yet for our climate problem, that's the only strategy so far. This is my current version of the chain of causation. I will be brief, serious readers can back up the recording to study them if the simpler cartoon on the next slide does not suffice. After the chain of seven, I list in the left column three places where interventions focus.
our climate problem as fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions as its root cause, accounting for two-thirds of the overheating. The greenhouse gas excess also creates knock-ons, such as ocean acidification and extreme weather. Here is how I imagine the relevant row of knock-ons. And identify three types of interventions, those yellow posters. 1. Emissions reductions, a category that contains almost every strategy you have heard about. 2. A cleanup of the carbon dioxide already in the air, don't confuse that with smokestack capture of new carbon dioxide, which is just another emissions reduction tactic, one whose cost means that even more coal must be burned, to make up for the lost kilowatts, used to power the scrubber. And 3. Bouncing incoming sunlight back out into space, it need not utilize sulfuric acid in the style of volcanic eruptions, powdered chalk also works and its fallout is benign. It may take reflecting sunlight near the North Pole to buy us some time to do the cleanup, while the small halo will not cool us globally, just the high Arctic, that might reduce the craziness of the polar jet stream, associated with Arctic overheating. Both why so big? And why surefire? Are really aspects of why so fast? The need for speed is primarily because of the slippery slope we are on. No second chances. Further surges in extreme weather could collapse the global economy. Make it difficult to build or operate scrubbers. Once the time frame is established, how big a project does that imply? History may be relevant. When was the last time we had a stable climate? The 1950s and 1960s lacked major trends. The CO2 now is at 420 parts per million, an excess of 140, 50% above 280. In the 1960s the CO2 was about 330, an excess of 50 parts per million. Safety margin reasoning says, aim to remove all of the excess CO2. This 20-year project is the fastest that I can imagine, for doing 3,400 gigatons of excess CO2 cleanup by 2040. Were we to take 40 years to finish it, we would have to remove almost 5,000 gigatons of CO2 and suffer 40 years of extreme weather surges, and their wars, economic crashes, etc., threatening the viability of the project. By 2050, rising sea level, cooling off does not fix it, will become very expensive, what with relocating coastal populations. Essential to finish CO2 removal by 2040 if we are to deal with all of the coastal refugees after then. This is the checklist of design criteria that I use to compare my simplified project to other CO2 removal proposals. Big. Quick. Surefire. But some proposed projects are gluttons for fuel, power, fresh water, and land surface area. They are all vulnerable. I added terrorist proofing, as a concentrated scrubbing site would be attractive to hold for ransom. Many dispersed scrubbing sites would be better. Also, should things not go well, one wants the scrubbers to be low maintenance so that even fishing fleets could keep them going. The line for suggestions comes with a caution, that the time is passed for suggestions that stall. That's the fifth missed exit on the freeway to hell. Time to wake up. But some additional criteria will work if delayed a decade into the project, as with the International Climate Commissioners, coming up. The big project will also need to avoid competing for fuel, electricity, fresh water, and agricultural land. It must avoid creating intolerable side effects. My teaching example, intentionally simplified, appears to satisfy most of those criteria, though it may need additional pipes to recycle some phosphate. Any improved versions will need to check the same boxes. It will take a convocation of experts a few years, with multiple prototypes being tested. In the US, what we need this year is a kickstart that does the design and prototype testing while we educate Congress about the need for taking over the nonprofit project a few years later. Similar design projects elsewhere should not wait on coordinating with the U.S., 
whose politics are currently marginal for taking the lead and whose constitutional structure guarantees delay, as in the U.S. two-year delay in engaging Hitler. Here is a sample process for a cleanup scheme which might suffice, if sufficiently improved by the experts on the ocean carbon cycle. It suggests that a major recovery is still possible. It is not a ready-to-roll proposal so much as a challenge to the real experts, something to improve or replace in a solution space constrained by the need to be. Big, annual capacity 270 gigatons of CO2 each year after 2030, sinking 3,400 gigatons of potential CO2 by 2040. Quick, CO2 to 1960s concentration by 2040, and the project sure to work and secure from extreme weather and terrorists. Searching for a sinking solution. Let us take a look at what's currently available to the big project's design team, natural processes that sink carbon, capable of being boosted. Pipes, funnels, and other proposed pieces of engineering. I'll explain that diagram in a minute. This slide is just a reminder of the geoengineering proposals covered in my third talk of this series. Explaining the ocean's carbon cycle, top section, would take several lectures. At top left, we see CO2 equilibrating, with fluxes going both in and out. Much of what enters forms weak bonds with H2O, such bonds are so easily undone that we speak of the CO2 as being buffered, easily reverting to dissolved CO2. That DIC box represents both the dissolved and the buffered, it is what is called total CO2 on clinical reports. The convergence of the arrows shows the photosynthesis step, where phytoplankton and some bacteria make a new cell using dissolved CO2 and nutrients as raw material. It lives for a few days, becoming cell debris that is food for bacteria. It is their respiration that turns organic carbon, hydrocarbon molecules, back into CO2. If small enough to stay suspended in the surface waters, DOC is dissolved organic carbon, debris may avoid becoming CO2 for 10 days, though some is still around for 30 to 40 days. Otherwise, it and the feces may sink as POC, particulate organic carbon. If it falls apart, as feces tend to do, it may become suspended at various depths. This gravitational settling is known as the biological carbon pump. Very little becomes sediment on the ocean floor, perhaps one-tenth of one percent. The rest stays suspended or dissolved in the deep waters, 98% of ocean volume. That is an enormous reservoir, were we to sink our excess 3,400 gigatons of CO2 into the ocean depths, it would only add one or two percent to the reservoir. The left column shows how long that potential CO2 takes to make it up to the surface. Even when it does, the DOC seems protected from escaping into the air to overheat us. It might take four to five circuits before succeeding. So, the excess CO2 would stay hidden from equilibration into the atmosphere for a few thousand years. Besides the gravitational sinking, there are downwelling currents. Vertical rivers, mostly located in ocean waters near Greenland, 10 kilometers wide clockwise spirals out on the edges of the 200 kilometer counterclockwise eddies. They carry everything down, including heat. The DOC concentration in the surface water pump down contains 1000 X as much potential CO2 as does what is settled down by gravity. That is what makes down pumps such a big player. Much of that potential CO2 can be sunk before it oxidizes into CO2. That's a quick summary of the natural processes that sequester carbon in the ocean depths. How does one augment them? We can surely mimic such downflows with pipes, far right. What about upwelling the DOC that accumulates just below the thermocline? Winds do that, the upwelled nutrients triggering plankton blooms. They turn blue water green. We can mimic that as well, using devices such as that Bernoulli suction pump. Coming up. Ignore the right-hand side as I will explain it in the following slide. Stephen Salter's funnel pump starts with meter-high circular buoy, into which is mounted a funnel connected to the downpipe. 1A. 
a wave comes along which overtops the buoy and fills the funnel. 1b. Which when the buoy rights itself, creates a hydrostatic pressure forces the warm surface water down 1 meter. 1c. Several hundred waves later, this ex-surface water laden with dissolved organic matter and living cells emerges from the bottom of the pipe, having cooled on the trip down. 1d. Siding the down pumps near the edge of the continental shelf, much of the carbon-rich water slides down the continental slope into deeper water. Long-term storage Another pumping scheme available to augment natural upwelling uses the centuries-old Bernoulli suction pump. This works best with small openings, so imagine a bundle of straws spanning the thermocline. Tidal currents flow faster near the surface and, since the bundle is tethered to the bottom by cables, tides power this pump. The upwelled nutrients are spread around in the wind-mixed surface layer. Thermocline defined, below the wind-mixed layer, circulation is slow. Falling debris accumulates and water stays cold because of lack of warm surface water mixed in. A pump by itself would not work because of the CO2 it brought up. It must be paired with an even more efficient down pump in the familiar push-pull configuration. Flexible pipes of 50 meter length are readily available for quick field tests. So are thousands of disused drilling platforms. Plankton thrive best in cooler waters than those in the Gulf of Mexico, the drilling platforms in the North Sea might be better. For the next few years, what we need is something like the Governor's Design Initiative to draw down CO2. Kickstarting a climate fix. It is now so urgent that we cannot wait for the US Congress to get moving, let alone wait for an international treaty. We need a workaround to design and prototype by 2025. The problem is how to do this quickly enough. I suggest that we cannot wait for international discussions to share the burden, that can be saved for later. What we need is for that Manhattan Project 2.0 to get the design and testing underway this year. To give a US-based example of a workaround, the CO2 Foundation did a white paper, the Governor's Design Initiative to draw down the excess CO2. In the case of the U.S. Congress, it may take a tested prototype to sell them on proceeding with deployment. The Governor's Design Initiative would be a non-profit, run by three state governors so there is some degree of political responsibility. Say, the governors of Washington, Oregon, and California. The non-profit's finance committee might be a dozen tech billionaires. The governors would utilize their state environmental staffs to help select team leaders, then select a general manager. And the governors would likely choose as leader someone with an established reputation for quick design and build. It need not be an army general this time, though DARPA could surely provide some excellent candidates. In the last 40 years, we have seen serial entrepreneurs who have repeatedly managed to design, prototype, and deploy within half a decade. The governors would likely go fishing in those waters as well. To be blunt, we must act before we become trapped on a slippery slope as climate worsens, falling faster no matter how hard we try to recover. Physicians have seen this happen many times. Before the patient's condition begins to deteriorate, 
it is very important to begin rapid treatment. Pessimistic? We tell med students, why bother? It is a waste of time. Get to work. It's not going to be a trouble-free future. So, what else is new? There were 100,000 generations of genus Homo that faced big challenges. Working to improve the situation is far better than the depression and despair that comes with focusing on helplessness. PS forecasts are always incomplete. We don't know everything yet about the physics of the situation we are in. We could be surprised. Just don't count on it. Nuclear physics has two great stories about what happens to future prospects when something is left out of the analysis, say, the energy hidden during the collapse of a giant star billions of years ago. There was Lord Kelvin's 1863 calculation, that Earth was no more than 100 million years old, it's really 46 times older, all because no one yet knew about the heat released during spontaneous radioactive decay, warming the Earth from within. Next there was the curve of binding energy realizations, see John McPhee's book, about 1940, that led to Einstein's letter to President Roosevelt and the Manhattan Project. There is stored energy that can be tapped with some slow-moving neutrons. Is there something like that, undiscovered, that could alter our climate prospects? Remember that climate science is a young science, likely with basic discoveries yet to be made. Here is the timeline that follows from our desire to remove the excess CO2 before 2040. There is a year to get the money and gather the experts. The design phase produces some initial prototype scrubbers to field test. Mass production begins, with design continuing during mass deployment. Cooling should begin in the following year. Full production capacity of minus 270 gigatons of CO2 is achieved by 2030. By 2040, it should have removed 3,400 gigatons of CO2 from the carbon cycle. After 2040, there would still be a need to counter continuing annual emissions. Who is to govern such a hurried project? There is a need to be nimble, so I suggest many starts in many places, especially in countries that make decisions slowly. There are technocratic countries such as China that might skip this step. But before deployment, I would expect national governments to participate. Because the continental shelf in colder waters is an ideal place for my sample project, I can imagine early starts without international agreement. Just as in regulating the economy, an expert panel would be a logical solution. By 2030, experts from many nations would have participated and would be logical commissioners. I thank you for your attention. The other three talks in this series can be found on YouTube via the links at williamcalvin.com 2021. Until next time. Any questions?